People turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. It, we're continuing our study, of course, of the book of Acts. It's the history of the church, first century. We move into chapter 5, and the persecution has begun. And it's going to get stronger and stronger. And, you know, we talked about this about, uh, I think if we put the slide. We've, we've talked about how problems have come upon the church. Sometimes uh, there's problems within. We saw that with the two believers, how they lied in and they died. And now there's going to be problems without. The religious leaders arrest the apostles. And we see that that's the way it is. Sometimes there are problems. There are problems within and without believers. And here's the thing. Usually when there are problems without, that makes the church stronger. Usually when there are problems within, that usually divides the church and destroys the church. This morning, we see the apostles' defense for a second time before the Sanhedrin. And we're going to focus on their rest, their offense, and the results. How do they react? What do they do? I think there's a lot. Let me raise some questions just to think about. Why were the apostles arrested? How did the apostles get out of prison? Who is Gamaliel? And what did he suggest? And how did the apostles react to this event? I think there's some things there that we could apply in our lives as we look at the idea of standing for Jesus Christ in a fallen world. Well, let me start with this by, by just mentioning angels. I mean, who are they? What do they do? You know, they're very powerful beings. In fact, Human beings are fascinated with angels. I can remember, this goes all the way back to 1995, but I remember going on campus at OSU and going into the bookstore, and they had the, like, the top 40 books, and actually they had the list of the top 20 books, but in that list, six of those books dealt with angels. And when you start talking to people and say about angels, people are interested in supernatural things, they're interested in angels, and so we could say, well, who are angels? What do they do? Well, this morning we're going to see an angel. An angel comes and lets them out of prison. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says that angels are ministering spirits sent by God to minister to those, to, to the believers. And, and so today, as we look at this, we'll see angels, we'll see what these men do, what, our apostles, what the apostles do, and then how we can apply it in our lives. Let me give you a brief review as we begin. It's the beginning of the church. Believers have been standing for Christ. Peter has stood before a large crowd and proclaimed the death and resurrection of Christ. 3,000 people believed. Later on, another thing happened. A great crowd came again. He proclaimed the death and resurrection of Christ. 5,000 men believed. Not just, didn't even count the women and children. It was just the men. As we moved into chapter 5, we see some problems develop, both within and without of the church. We saw in the first 17, basically first 16 verses of this chapter, we saw a problem from within. Uh, a couple of the believers uh, basically sold some property, uh, took part of the money and gave it to the church, but what they told was this was all of the money. They basically lied. They lied to God. They lied to the apostles, but because they lied to God, they died. It was a problem within the body, and it was handled very quickly. As we look at this passage this morning, beginning at verse 17, there's a problem outside the body from people from without are coming in. Let me give you the outline of the passage. We're going to see the apostles are going to be arrested. We're going to see the angel delivers them. We see the trial of the defense. And then we see the Sanhedrin's response to this whole thing. And you know, it's a long passage, so we'll go fairly quickly through it. We see Gamaliel stands up and talks, and we see the results of the whole thing. Now, um, try to remember this, and this is the key. Problems from outside almost never hurt the church. In fact, it makes it stronger. Problems from within destroy the church, break the unity and the testimony of the believers. So remember that as we go through this. That's why I think that this problem within the church in chapter 5, verses 1 through 16, it was handled so quickly. Because in that early church, there was great division and unity and love. And so we'll see that. Well, let's see what happens this morning. And, and uh, after... After Ananias and Sapphira died, you remember, people went, whoa, uh, we're not going to try to be apostles, that's for sure. We'll, they're great people, but we're not going to get involved with them. And, but what we found out is people were believing all over the place. There were people trusting Christ all over the place. The apostles were doing signs and miracles. If you look at chapter four, at verse 14, it says, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to the number. So more and more people are believing so when you see this first century, there's just all kind of people trusting in Christ and the believers, the numbers of the believers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, we're going to see when we get to next week, that there's a problem because the church is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we'll see what happens. Well, look what happens now. The apostles are proclaiming the truth and the religious leaders don't like it. Look at verse 17. But the high priest rose up 
along with his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. Now remember, most of the high priests were of the sect of the Sadducees. You remember they were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were the Essenes, they were Herodians, they were all different groups of people. The Pharisees were the ones that basically said they were the legalists. They said we keep all the laws and all the rules and the rituals. The Sadducees said, oh, we, keep, we, we believe the Bible and everything, but we don't, we don't believe the supernatural things. We don't believe in angels, we don't believe in resurrection, and, and these, these people were the priests. And they were the leaders. Now you remember that Peter is proclaiming Jesus Christ died and what? Rose again. They're proclaiming resurrection. That makes these high priests, these Sadducees really angry because they don't believe in resurrection. And so look what happens. It says that then the high priest rose up along with his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. Now at this point we don't know whether the high priest is Annas or Caiaphas, because they're both sometimes called high priest. And, and uh, the, these Sadducees didn't want anything supernatural, resurrection, so it says they were filled with jealousy. Why are they jealous? Think about this. Why are they jealous? Well, because the apostles are teaching about resurrection, and they don't believe in resurrection. The people are listening to the apostles, not listening to the priest. Priests are jealous about that, and then they were afraid they would lose their authority authority and control over the people. So they're saying, this is bad news. These people are out there talking about resurrection. We don't believe in resurrection. These people, all the people that are listening to these people, they need to be listening to us. If we're not careful, people are going to turn away from us and, and the, the apostles are going to have all the, the people following them. So here's what they decided to do. They went out in verse 18, they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. By the way, public jail was really a horrible place. That, I think they did it in a public jail so that everyone could see that the apostles got arrested. It wasn't just Peter. It was all the apostles were arrested and put in a public jail. Here's what they figure. Okay, we killed Jesus. Okay, that should have stopped it. It didn't stop it. These people are doing stuff. We got to get these leaders. If we can get these leaders, we can stop this whole thing. Well, look at verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, said to them, Go stand and speak in to the people in the temple the whole message of life. In, in the night, an angel came and got them out of prison. Now, God sends one of his ministering spirits. They're sent. Of course, they're given to serve men and to serve God. And let's talk about angels for just a second. Angels are very, very powerful beings. If an angel appeared in here, we would probably all bow down because they're such powerful beings. One angel in the Old Testament killed 185,000 Assyrian troops. One angel. And when you think about angels, we always say, okay, there's good angels and bad angels. We think of angels who, who follow God and live for Him, and that's called, we call those good angels or elect angels. And then there's angels that have rebelled with Satan, and we call those demons. That's what we mostly say. And so there's two different groups of angels. This is a good angel. This angel was sent by God to let them out of prison. When you think about angels, I mean, there's an angel called Gabriel. He's the messenger angel. There's Michael, who's called the archangel. There's an angel, Lucifer, who is actually the devil. So that's at least three angel names that we know. During in the night, angel came, opened the gates of the prison, and took them out. Now, let me ask you something. What about the other prisoners? And what about the guards? And what about the locks? Somehow the angel came and just opened all the doors and put everybody in like a stupor or a sleep or something, pulled them out, shut the door and said, now here's what I want you to do. Verse 20. Look what he says. Go, stand, and speak to the whole people in the temple, speak to the people in the whole message of this life. Now he told them to do this. Go, stand and speak in the temple. And that's what they had been doing. They'd go to the temple every day at Solomon's portico and they would stand up and they would proclaim about Jesus Christ. He says, go do that. Go to the temple. And notice what he says. Speak the whole message of this life. See, the message that they're proclaiming and the message that we proclaim is a message of life. See, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him will never perish but have eternal life. Over and over the message that we proclaim is the message of life. First John 5 11 through 13. He who has the Son has life. Who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things are written to you that you might believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. So if you have the Son you have life. They're proclaiming a message of life. See, we come into this world, what? Dead in trespasses and sins. We're spiritually dead. We're in darkness. When we trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, He gives us life, eternal life. So it's so powerful. And so and when we see this, there, He says, the angel actually tells them, you go and you speak the whole message of this life. When we go out these doors, our message is not that Jesus will make you have a happy life. Our message is that Jesus gives you eternal life. 
go and tell. Notice the angel of the Lord is telling them the exact opposite, opposite message of the religious leaders. Religious leaders said, don't talk about Jesus. They say, go tell everybody about this life. This is what we're to do. We go out this door, these doors, we go into the campus, we go in this community, we go in our neighborhoods, we're going with a message that brings life. So amazing. Well, what happens? Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. And they did exactly what they were supposed to do. When it became morning, they went into the temple really early in the morning. As, you know, they, there was a guy that would, uh, one of the priests would stand uh, at the top of the temple and he would wait, he had a, he had a trumpet, and as soon as he saw the sun break the, the horizon, he would blow a trumpet, they would open the temple doors, and people would come in. As soon as the doors were open, the apostles came right back into the temple, went to Solomon's portico, and began to proclaim the message. It says they began to teach. And the way it's written in the Greek, it's like they kept on going, they kept on going, they kept on teaching. They did exactly what they're supposed to do. By the way, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do whatever God tells us to do. Well, watch what happens. Now, when the high priest, this is still verse 21. Now, when the high priest and the associates came, they called the council together, even all the synod of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. Now, we've talked about this before, but the ruling body of Israel were caused the Sanhedrin that had 70 people. The high priest was one of the 70. There were 69 other men, and they were the religious leaders. Many of them were Sadducees. Most of them were Pharisees, but the Sadducees controlled everything and so they, they were going to bring the senate together as they called it they were going to bring the Sanhedrin together and their plan was to go bring those guys they got in jail bring them back and tell them we've told you you can't talk about just Jesus anymore so they, they, they sent for them but look at verse 22 but the officers who came did not find them in the prison and they returned and reported back saying we found the prison door locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors but when we opened up we found nobody inside they said, go get those guys and bring them back here. All of a sudden, they come back and they look at them and say, where are the people? They said, well, we went to the place. The doors were locked. The guards were there. We opened it all up. They weren't in there. You can just see them going, what do you mean they weren't in there? They weren't in there. There wasn't anybody in there. The apostles you arrested yesterday and put in there with the guards, they weren't in there? No, they weren't in there. How is that? That's impossible. Now, let me tell you what the Sadducees thought. They said, this sounds like something supernatural, <laughs> but we don't believe in supernatural. Right? So we can't say this must be some supernatural thing. We don't know what's going on. And notice what happened. Verse 23 again, we found the prison locked lock quite securely and the guards were standing at the doors. But when we opened up, we saw nobody inside. Then the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words. They were greatly perplexed about them as what would come of this. They're saying, I don't know what's going to happen here because this makes us look bad. I mean, we arrested these guys, threw them in jail. The plan was to bring them out this morning. And so then we go back there and we can't even find them. This makes us look really bad. And we really want to look really good because that's the plan. Well, watch. But someone, right in the middle of all this, someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. A guy comes in and says, you know those guys y'all put in jail? They're, they're in the temple. I mean, we just went by the temple. There's a whole bunch of them. They're, all, they're in the temple doing what they've been doing every day. The guys you put in jail are in temple. How can this be? Well, we had them in the jail, and now they're right back doing the thing we tried to stop them to do. Let me just tell you something. Nothing can stop the work of the Lord. Nothing. God's plans and purposes are going to be accomplished. Nothing can stop it. They can throw them in jail all they want to. God's gonna, God is, can do, is going to get his word out. This plan is to use us to go into this community with the message. Nothing can stop God's plan. But nothing can stop the church. The gates of hell cannot what? Cannot prevail against it. Listen, God's, God's message is going to get out. We're going to take this message. We're going to take it to the whole world. And nothing can stop it. Well, look what happened. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. The captain, captain of the temple guard, remember we talked about this several weeks ago, there was the high priest, and he was over everything. And then usually there was another person who would uh, be the next priest. There was a guy called the captain of the temple, and he, he decided everything that happened in the temple that day. Oftentimes, now remember, this is not biblical because by the time this happened, the Romans decided who would be the high priest. Not biblically. But biblically, it was supposed to be a descendant of Aaron and the oldest son after that. Well, they weren't doing that anymore. So this, this temple, this, this captain of the temple, he most likely, 
he most likely might be the next high priest. He's a very important man, second only to the high priest. And so he went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. So he, he, he decides, he says, listen, I will go into the temple and get these men. So here they go, these, these important religious men, and they go and they find Peter and James, and they said, uh, you guys got to stop, and we want you to come before the Sanhedrin. Now, you know what the apostles do? They don't put up a fuss. They say, okay, we'll come. They had to be really careful. See, they said they were afraid that the people might, uh, that they might be stoned. See, they were afraid because the apostles are becoming well liked by the people. Everybody's liking them. Why? Well, l look at this. Why were they so liked? Well, first of all, they'd done miracles. Remember, we already saw in this passage how they had done some miracles and that people were getting healed and people were bringing people from outside Jerusalem, bringing them in, and, the and they were all being healed. And so everybody says, these are good people. Look what happened. Uh, this person was very sick, and now they're not sick. This must be from God. They, second, they had authority. They spoke the word of God. See, the authority is the word of God, and they were speaking. The and third, they were, the people were sick of religious traditions and legalism. Listen, all you have to do is put yourself under legalism. It will not take long for you to go, I hate this stuff. This stuff is ridiculous. Where did all these rules come from? What is, what is all this? This doesn't seem like what it's supposed to be. By this time, the average person, they despised the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they were so sick of all the rules and the things. And, and apostles weren't even talking about rules. They were talking about grace. They were talking about Jesus Christ. They were talking about eternal life. They were talking about living forever. And so people are saying, we like these guys. And so when the, the captain and the officers came, they took it very carefully because they knew that the people were really angry with them. And let's talk for a second because what you see on one hand is religion. And what you see on the other hand is what I call true Christianity. See, religion is man trying to do something to please God. It always works. Christianity is God pleasing God. And I'm talking about biblical Christianity. See, religion is always goes back to, to works. It always goes back to works. Where Christianity goes back to faith. And so when you think of religion, you think of people trying to do something. Just think of the religions in the world. You know, some people have to pray seven times a day. Some people have to make this trip. They have to do this. They have to do this. They have to be willing to do this. They have to humble themselves. When you turn to Christianity, it's not what you do that saves you. It's you take the gift of eternal life, which comes from Jesus Christ, who's done it all. He died on the cross. He paid for sin. He rose again. He gives you eternal life. So there's a big difference between religion and Christianity. So when a lot of people say, hey, are you religious? I go, I'm not religious at all. Now, I've trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. I'm a Christian. Now, I know that the world takes Christianity and calls it a religion. We know that. But if you look at it biblically, religion is man trying to do something to get to God. Christianity is God pleasing God. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Well, look what happened. When they brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Have you noticed that they won't use the name Jesus? <laughs> they won't say Jesus' name. They brought them before the council. They stood them there, and the high priest began to question them. And here's what he said. We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. What name? the name of Jesus. See, the name of Jesus is the name. The name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And they said, you, you fill Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man, not Jesus, this man's blood upon us. Let me just say something about the name Jesus Christ. You can go anywhere you want to and talk to all kind of people and all you have to say is God and everybody's happy. Oh, I love God. Don't you love God? I love God. Everybody loves God. Then you say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, the Christ, is the Savior. And you're going to make a whole bunch of people mad. You can go in any religious organization, a whole bunch of religious people, and you say God over and over, and everybody's on your side. You say Jesus and Him alone, and you got a whole bunch of people mad at you. 
these religious leaders won't even say the name Jesus because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the name given among, uh, there's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we might be saved except the name Jesus Christ. Look what it says. They said, you, 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 and you are, you're teaching, you you're fill Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. He's saying, you're blaming us for his death. So they were upset because they were teaching death and resurrection and they were blaming them for the death. See, they said, you're trying to tell everybody we killed him. The truth is they did. They did. Religious leaders turned him over to the Romans, and Romans put him to death. And they, they, don't want, they don't want to say they did it. And so notice what it says. Uh, we, you, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, and we've told, and you, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You notice they never said, how did y'all get out of that thing? Because they knew it was something supernatural. They knew it was something miraculous. They're not going to say, how did y'all get out? And they say, angels. Oh, but y'all don't believe in angels. I'm sorry. See? So they never even ask how they got out. They ne they're afraid to ask it. Now I want you to see what Peter does. Because the, it says the apostles speak, but Peter's the one answered. It says Peter and the apostles answer. Peter's probably the leader. You realize not too long ago, Peter was afraid in front of a servant girl. He was afraid to say he believed in Jesus. And then after the death and resurrection of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, he stands up and he is publicly declaring over and over and over the truths of Jesus Christ. So look, look, look what he does here. But Peter and the apostles answered. Here's the simple answer. We must obey God rather than men. Peter's answer is, we must do what God tells us to do rather than what men tell us to do. Men have said, don't speak the name of Jesus. Don't talk about Jesus. Don't tell that. And they said, no, no, we've got to do what God told us to do. Jesus had already told us, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the most part of the earth. We've already been told that we're to make disciples, going into the world, baptizing people, putting them, uh, leading them to Christ, identifying them to Christ, and then teaching them. We know what we're supposed to do. He says, we have a commission. It's to make disciples, proclaiming Christ and training believers. That's the same commission we have, isn't it? Aren't we supposed to do the exact same thing the apostles did? They're going in the community and telling people about Jesus Christ and how he died and rose again. And if, they have eternal, and if they trust in him, they have eternal life. And the plan is to make disciples, leading people to Christ and then training and equip him. We go into this community with the exact same message that Jesus died and rose again. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. Our goal is to lead people to Christ and train them and equip them. That's make disciples. Same thing. Look what he goes on to say. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. Once again, it's the same message, the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, he puts it backwards this time. He says, God raised up Jesus who you died, who you killed. That's the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just remember the central focus of every message in the book of Acts is the death and resurrection of Christ. Every time you watch it, as we go through it, so far we've seen every message, and every message so far has had the central point, the death and resurrection of Christ. We're going to see it all the way through the whole book. That tells us something, that the message that we proclaim in this community is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. So Peter says, we've got to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, who you put to death. You put him on the cross. You killed him. And then he says these words. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. He is the one. Where is Jesus right now? Peter says he's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He's the one that God has exalted. See, the bottom line is Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven, became a human being, humbled himself to be obedient to death, even the death of the cross, whom God has highly exhausted and raised him up and seated him in heavenly places. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. That's the truth. Peter is saying it. God has exalted Jesus to the right hand of the Father. He is the Savior. He humbled himself. He died. He rose again. Wow. And he calls, he says, he's the one God exalted right hand to grant him as, and he, and he really calls him two different things. He calls him, I think, prince and savior. Look, for, for, first of all, he calls him prince. He is the prince. The word prince there means the leader. It means the, the one who makes it happen. So he's the one that makes it happen. He's also the savior. And I mean, that's key because that's what his name means. The name Jesus means savior. John, uh, Matthew one twenty one. you shall call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. He is the savior and the prince. And so he says he is the one that God has exalted as prince, savior, to grant, notice, repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Uh, whenever he deals with Israel as a whole, he always talks about repentance because repent means to change your mind. I think I've got it up there. They needed to change their mind. 
mind. See, they looked at Jesus as, as, as something wrong, and they needed to understand that Jesus was the Son of God, the Savior, and they needed to change their mind and put their faith in Christ. And so he says, to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins comes by faith. It's always that way. Jesus died and rose again and ascended. And all who change their mind, they say in this passage, if they believe in him, they will have forgiveness of sin. And through the scripture, you see that whenever people believe in Christ, they get righteousness, they get forgiveness, and they get eternal life. Over and over, that's what we see that comes by faith. And that's what we have to do. We clearly go into this community with this simple message. Jesus died and rose again. You believe in him, you have life. You believe in him, you have forgiveness. You believe in him, you have righteousness. It all comes by faith. Look what he says. And we're witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. He says, we're witnesses of all this. We're witnesses of who Jesus is, how he died, how he rose again, how he ascended to the right hand of the Father, how he is the one that gives eternal life. We're witnesses of this, and so is the Holy Spirit. He's proclaiming that the Holy Spirit's involved in all this as well. And then when he says, and who the Holy Spirit's given to those who obey him, the word obey there has the idea of believing in him. He says, those who obey him, believe him. Believe him how? He says, this is the will of God that you should believe in the one who has sent. And so you get the Holy Spirit when you believe in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying. Now watch. What if, what if you had been there and you're one of these religious leaders? First of all, you don't like the apostles. They're taking your place. You, you look bad. They're blaming you for the death of this Jesus. You don't like any of these things that are happening. People are following these guys. And, and every time you turn around, they're doing something miraculous. And you're beginning to be worried about them. And now they've told you again, Jesus died and rose again. You're the ones that killed him. God's behind all of this. The God of our fathers is the one who sent Jesus. It's all in God's plan. Jesus is the Savior. And anybody that will believe in him will have forgiveness of sins. What's their response? When the message of Jesus Christ is proclaimed to people, when we go out these doors and we have an opportunity to proclaim the message of Christ, there's going to be one of two responses. Either people are going to believe, they're going to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, or they're going to reject. Now in this passage, the religious leaders reject. Look what they do. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. The, the word cut to the quick means to be enraged. They, 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 were, they, were, they were so angry now, let me tell you something. They're ready to, to take these men out and stone them, to kill them. That's their plan. In fact, all they have to do is just give another five minutes and it's over. They're going to grab the apostles, bring them out, and kill every one of them. But something stops it. Now, you're going to see a little bit later when you get to chapter 6 and chapter 7, there's going to be a man named Stephen stands before these same people. They get mad again, but nobody stops them, and they take him out and they kill him. So this is just a view of something to come. So look what happens. When they heard this, they were, they were cut to the quick, and they intended to kill him. They said, we're going to kill these people. These religious leaders are angry. They wanted to kill. And right in the middle of this, a man stands up. And if you're thinking of this from a human standpoint, the apostles would say, I'm sure glad that guy stood up. But God's in control. There's a man, his name is Gamaliel. He's a famous teacher. In fact, in this day and time, he is the most famous teacher in all of Israel. He, throughout all of the history of the nation of Israel, they have all these rabbis and these teachers. There are only seven rabbis who have ever been called rabbi. He was the first one in the history of the nation of Israel to be called rabbi. This man right here is going to stand up. He was Paul's teacher. He was a famous teacher. He had studied under a man by the name of Hillel, who was a famous rabbi as well. What does he do? But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, notice, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. You can see it. These people are so mad. They're getting up. They're about to go kill. He says, hold it, hold it, hold it. Put these people out for a while. Put them out, put them out. So they put them out. Now, he stopped it because he's respected by everybody. Now, he's not a Sadducee. He's a Pharisee. Sadducees don't really like him, but he's so respected because if you said, who's the best teacher in Israel? Gamaliel. That's the man. So he stands up. And when you think about this man, he's the teacher of the law. He was Paul's teacher. He's a famous rabbi. His son, Yesha, became the high priest in 63 to 65. A.D. His son did. He was a teacher of the law. Look what he says. 
And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. He says, be really careful what you're thinking about doing. What does he say? For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody. A group of about 400 men joined with him. But when he was killed, all the followers were dispersed and came to nothing. He says, you remember there was that guy named Thaddeus? They're not sure when all this happened. But this guy named Thaddeus rose up, and, 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 and 400 men followed him. And he was claiming to be something great. And when he died, his people went to nothing. And then, he says, and after this, after this, man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census as about... Hmm, somewhere about 3, 4 B.C. Uh, and he drew away some people after him. And when he perished, everybody followed him scattered. So he says, listen, there was some guy, there's been people all along rising up to claim to be something. And whenever they died, the people following them just dispersed to nothing. Now what's he implying? This Jesus rose up to be something, and now he's dead. And either... In ju if you just give it time, these people will just scatter away and come to nothing because it is nothing. Or, if he's really from God, you can't fight this thing. Watch what he says. So in this present case, verse 38, I'm saying to you, stay away from these men, let them alone. For if, and by the way, I've got to tell you something, the way this is written. Verse 38 says, I say to you, stay away from men and let them alone for if, that is a third class if in Greek, which means if, maybe it's true and maybe it's not. If these men, if this plan or action, and we don't know, maybe it is, maybe not, as a men, it will be overthrown. But look at the next verse. But if it is of God, that's a first class if, if, and it's true. This is of God. You'll not be able to overthrow them, or else you'll be fight, found to be fighting against God. He implies that he actually thinks this may be from God. This is the leading teacher in Israel saying, if maybe it is, maybe it's not from men, it'll perish. If, and it's true, it's from God, you can't fight it. Why do you think he stood up in this group? Why do you think he protected the apostles? There are some people who believe, by the way this is phrased, that he may have become a believer. And he's saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If this is from men, and we don't know if it is or not, it'll go away. If it's from God, and it may be, and you can't fight against it. You'll be found fighting against God. If it's men, it's nothing. If it's God, nothing can stop it. And that's what we said a while ago. Nothing can stop God's plan. So look what they did. They took his advice. And calling in the apostles, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released him. So he took his advice not to kill him. But what did they do? They brought him in and they beat him. And then when it says flogged him, don't think of like a th three or four lashes. Thirty-nine lashes. In all of the history of reading these things, they had two-thirds of the lashes were on their backs and one-third of the lashes were on their front. So they beat them time and time again on the front. They beat them time and time on the back. Listen, it just wasn't a few lashes, 39. And then they let them go. And what did they say to them? Don't talk about these, th this name of Jesus anymore. Let me ask you a question. You think it's going to stop them? Nothing going to stop them. Let me ask you a question. What will stop us from proclaiming Jesus Christ? It might be a bad look. Oh, you're a Christian? Well, yeah, yeah, well, it's no big deal. What stops us day in and day out from proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ? Is it because we're afraid that we'd be embarrassed or that somebody make fun of us or that uh, y y we won't advance in our job? Or, uh, you, you know, our relatives will think we've lost it. Our parents will think we've got in some kind of cult or something. What stops us from proclaiming the truth? Well, look what they did. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. They went out rejoicing. That's what Philippians 1.29 says, that, you know, the whole idea that counted the fact that we're not only called to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake the great privilege to stand for Jesus Christ. But what else? L look at this. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. I love this because they continued to proclaim the message of Christ. Now I want to show you something. It said every day 
Notice, in the temple, that's a big meeting. From house to house, that's little meetings. They kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus the Christ. See, that's what they did. They met in the big groups, and they proclaimed the message, and they did this, and then they got into smaller groups. And that's why we tell you that we can come together on Sunday mornings, big groups, but we need also to have times in which we get into smaller groups so we can be accountable to each other and get to know each other and love one another and care about one another because it's hard to do it in a big group. So that's why it's so important that we talk about small groups. But notice this. Every day in the temple, house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching. The word preaching there, it actually is the word evangelion, which is the word we get evangelized from. Not only were they teaching, they were proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. It's powerful. And notice it says, preaching Jesus as the Christ. That means he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. Wow, what a message. So we see problems are developed from without. The apostles get arrested. Religious leaders put them in jail. Angel gets them out. Uh, they finally bring them back in there. They tell Peter to quit talking about it. Peter says, we're going to obey God rather than men. You're the ones that killed him. God raised him up. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. Everything. They're ready to kill him. And this man named Gamal stops it all, puts them out, says you can't stop it if it's from God. They bring him back in, whip them, and they leave. And they say, wow, what a joy. What an honor to be put to shame for Jesus Christ. What an honor. I was, this is a years and years and years ago when I was coaching at Mississippi State. And we were really fortunate. We had like 18 coaches on staff in those days. And what's so amazing is every one of the coaches were Christians. Every one of us. And then some years went by and a couple of them left and they hired a new guy that came in, one of the other assistant coaches, and he wasn't a Christian. And I remember sitting in the, back in those days we had athletic dorms and I was sitting in the athletic dorm eating and he came in and I just met him two days earlier and he said, hey, I've heard about you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I heard you're religious. And I said, well, no, I'm not really religious. I'm, I'm a Christian. I put my faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. And I started to talk to him, and he said, hey, don't talk to me. I think you're an idiot. Turn around and walked away. That was kind of a little bit embarrassing, because that was in front of some other people. But you know what? What a great thing to stand for Jesus Christ. Sometimes people are going to embarrass you if you stand for Christ, and they're going to say, you actually believe that? Good night. College kids, you get on that campus, and you stand up in those classes, and you tell people you believe in Christ, they're going to be professors, they're going to be other kids, they're going to say, you're an idiot to believe that kind of stuff. You say, well, you may think I'm an idiot, I'm not. And I count it all joy to suffer, suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. Let me give you some applications. First one is, let's understand the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is man doing something to please God, while Christianity is God pleasing God. Just remember that. We want to stand for the truth. We want to live for Jesus Christ. We want to understand that it's not what we do that gives us eternal life, and that religion is man trying to do something to get to God, but God's done it all. And l listen, here's the truth. I think I've got this as a slide. I think the next one. True Christianity, uh, no, go, go back, go back there. True Christianity bothers religion. <laughs> it does. When you live for Jesus Christ, it bothers religious people. It makes them look bad because they're trying to do laws and everything else and you're talking about grace and salvation and faith and, and you have joy, the joy of your salvation and, and they, they don't have joy because legalism doesn't bring joy. Rules don't bring joy. So just remember, understand the difference between religion and Christianity. Second, let's always, always obey God rather than men. We've got to do that. That's, we, we, we think about that we, we get to go into this community with a message of Christ. I think trust God in the trials and problems of life. We've seen the problems, the tri problems within, problems without. We've already seen it. We, we have to live for Christ. We have to obey the word. We have to be men and women who live by the truths and the principles of the Bible in the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to be afraid. He'll never leave us or forsake us. What should we fear? We should rejoice if we suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Now, in our country, uh, we, we got it. it. It's just, you know, I talked to you about persecution and how more people are being persecuted for Christ in the world than almost ever before. And in our country, we're okay. But, you know, it's, gonna, it's getting worse. It's getting worse and worse. And there's no telling what's going to happen in the years to come. We must always obey God rather than men. And the, last but not least, clearly proclaim the gospel. The gospel is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the central message all the way through the book of Acts. Whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. My prayer is this. If there's anyone in this room 
who, as you've come this morning, that you've never really understood the way of salvation, that you may have thought that, you know, trying to be good, that's religion, trying to do something to get to God. But I want you to understand that Jesus came, on, came and died on the cross to pay for all your sins and all our sins, and he rose again conquering death, and he offers to you a gift. It's not your works or goodness or righteousness or anything. It's the gift of eternal life, and it's simply by faith. You trust Christ as your Savior. You believe that he will give you eternal life, and when you trust in him, he gives you eternal life. So it's not your goodness, your righteousness, your faith, your, your faithfulness or anything. It's simply trusting in Jesus Christ for eternal life. I hope and pray that everyone in this room has put their faith in Christ as Savior.